going to talk about this topic. I cannot necessarily pronounce all the words on the slide. Um, I'm the lead for the multilingual initiative in Drupal 8. We started that over four years ago. And there's so there's a lot of work in this initiative. And what I'm going to talk about is a distal experience of what worked for us and some of what did not work for us. Uh, there's a lot more that did not work for us that I will probably not talk about, but we can definitely talk about in the questions. Um, so I believe in, in the spirit of repeating what works. So if we can repeat what worked here, I think that will be very helpful for the rest of the community. The talk is aimed at people who would want to do something in a community and either are not bosses with direct power to, to direct people, to tell them what to do, or they don't have the money to do so, or they have a desire to do a large-scale project that they think they will be unable to do, but as I think this project proves, they will be. Um, so I think the lessons are useful in a lot of ways, uh, and I distill them from the multilingual team. And I want to start with the lowest point of the initiative. For me, at least, was uh, 2012, May 22nd. Any guesses what happened on that day? Storm. Hmm? Storm? Storm, <laughs> yes. Lightning. So the Views and Drupal Core initiative was announced on that day. Hmm. And everybody was celebrating. And I was freaked out. Jesus Christ, they're going to destroy my work, they're going to steal the people, they get money in the project, I will not have people to work on my team, <coughs> they will, I don't know, so it was like the doom moment for me, because, so I was already working for a year on this initiative, they were getting people off my team, paying them to work on views, and views is like four times as big as the as the most popular multilingual module on Drupal.org. So I was like, ah. I was in rave, uh, and I sent an email to a lot of people uh, <coughs> leader, uh, who were in leadership positions, including all of the views in Drupal core team, that among other things said that in short, I cannot really tell at this point if I should be extremely happy for views being funded or be totally terrified that it makes it impossible for the multilingual team to reach its goals unless money is involved. Uh, so that was the first point in my work on the initiative in four years. And it basically came from my very long understanding of how I should do project management in open source. Because a uh, classic project manager, I've heard I'm not a project manager by training, sorry, so a classic project manager, I've been told, looks at this triangle and they say, I need to manage the cost of this project, I need to manage the scope of this project so it will not fly off and I need to manage the time. So it's ready in some amount of money uh, to some uh, scope of the project in a fixed amount of time and I can deal with the quality of the project between these uh, criteria. So I can lower the cost, get cheaper people to work on my thing, and it will lower the quality. Or I can do it faster, and it will lower the quality. Or I can do less, and it will maybe be good quality still. Right? So the problem with looking at this triangle in open source is you're very likely don't have money. Very likely. Even if you're using core, you don't have enough money to complete your project. Uh, it's extremely hard to scope a project in open source because there's way too many stakeholders involved, so you don't really know where the scope ends. And you have no idea when Drupal 8 is going to be released even today or years later. You don't know how much time you have or what kind of time you can cover it. So like a classic project management look on this is very hard. And, but if you take that look like I did for Views in Core, it's threatening if somebody comes in and they steal the money, they steal sponsors so you don't get the money, or they steal the people, or they 
are they getting more work, so you need to dial, dial back in your scope, or are they, they do a lot of stuff in forest, so core committers will not deal with your patches, they will deal with their patches, right? So if you look at, look at it from this fixed mindset, that everybody else is a threat, because they steal from the money, they steal from time, and they steal from the scope. That's not a good mindset for open source, because none of them are limited. So the first problem is you don't have the money. So I would I would substitute cost with people because you probably don't have you usually don't have a lot of cost that do not involve people. You don't need to buy parts for cars that you're building or whatever. You don't have those kind of expenses. And if you would be lucky to direct those people, then you could manage the other two. So let's say you're Google and you build Android, and you team up with a few other companies and you have people working on Android. So it's an open source project that those companies contribute people to work on. And then they do big releases where they announce all the things that they worked on created by those companies, and then they release them. So that's not how Drupal works. Drupal does not have uh, several companies pulling in a lot of developers to work on things. Drupal has a very long tail of contributors who spend their weekends, their uh, their uh, own money to go to conferences, etc. So you don't, you can't really plan your open source project that way. So Drupal is a truly open source project in the sense that it mo most of the developers working on Drupal Core are not paid, and even those who are paid may not be paid full time to work on Drupal Core. So you cannot really plan with this uh, room of people available to work for you and do whatever you want. There is definitely still money involved. So if you have money, you can definitely speed up things. There's be at least two big initiatives in Drupal 8. We use money to speed up their things. Actually, three initiatives. We use money to speed up things working on Drupal Core. Uh, views raised uh, 12 thousand dollars from the community for them to work on things. And while immediately it sounds like a lot of money, uh, again, Drupal 8 is being worked on for more than four years, so if you divide that for four years, it's peanuts. You would not pay the high-profile developers who work on views from that money. So the trick they use is they raised some money and they sprinted very fast and completed <coughs> the using core initiative in less than one year. And by com they, they, they find a completion point and they said that, okay, views in core is complete when views is in core. So as soon as views got committed, they said, we are complete, and they mostly dissolved the team. And a lot of other things that have happened since then, conversion of admin pages to views, conversion to uh, views plugins to fields, um, bug fixes around a lot of things happened afterwards, and they did not consider that part of their work. <coughs> So the good thing about that is they got views in core, so now it was the, the responsibility of the community to work with it, and then a lot, a lot more people could chip in. The bad thing is there was no project management around that work, so still to this day we are working on issues to fix, uh, fix views bugs and field handling, etc. that resulted from other changes in core that were not tracked because it was not closely managed. Uh, also, another example is the Configuration Management Initiative. They raised money as well, and they spent all that money before the configuration system was rewritten two more times later on. Uh, so they spent that money for an initial version of the configuration system, getting for, and then the initiative changed leadership, and then uh, other uh, methods got involved. And the third method is what the Drupal Association does right now, is the Drupal 8 Accelerate Fund, which is money to give to specific people and sprints for solving release blocking issues for Drupal Core. So it's not general initiatives like get media handling core or whatever, but it's specifically getting Drupal 8 done. It is very targeted on specific things. Um, so it's not, it's not the kind of project that you would want to do if you dream about getting uh, commerce in core or image handling in core or, 
or, or group handling for or whatever is your dream. Or if you if you dream about doing things in other communities, of course. So even those who raised money did not have success raising enough money to sustain their project long enough um, to be able to complete entirely open work. So instead, what we did in the multilingual community is party. So, so we tried to attract people with things other than money, so, uh, so they get a lot of use out of working with us in the multilingual team uh, without getting actually paid. So what we've been trying is to attract and retain people by things that were useful for them. There's a whole lot of things useful for people other than money, of course. Um, and three great uh, a framework for thinking about that along three angles is autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, so there was a person named Dan Pink who came up with this framework. But there's definitely a lot of others who figured this out before him. So he says that once you pay people enough money, or if you cannot pay people uh, to do things, then they will be driven by these three factors. Autonomy to figure out what they do on their own. Mastery to get better at something. And purpose if what they do makes some sense, make the, make the world a better place. So I think uh, purpose in the multilingual team is pretty nicely defined. So there's a few slides I usually show for my multilingual sessions of where, where our stuff is used. If you think about multilingual people being used uh, at the World Health Organization to, uh, to make, the, make the globe more healthy, or at the UNESCO, or at the um, at Amnesty International, these are all multilingual Google sites with actual screenshots. Or uh, this is the uh, uh, World Food Program, or it's used to advance science at the CERN, again, a multilingual Google site. So there's a lot of places Drupal is used to advance very good causes. And if you contribute to this, then, then you make the world a better place. Or if you want to think about empowering small groups who don't have the budget to work on uh, these big sites, then this is a, a group from Stanford. Uh, they make nice uh, logic boards for high school students to experiment with uh, technology. And they made a website on Drupal modeling the website in Drupal, in Portuguese, and, uh, and English. Um, so if you do this, then you're empowering basically everyone from CERN to the logic board people at Stanford. So, so basically the multilingual people, uh, the multilingual team's goal was to bring Drupal to more people on the globe, which is kind of nice. And I think we succeeded in a lot of ways making it work much easier for people. As much as people complain about Drupal 8 being this big shift from, <coughs> from the simple days of Drupal to the very complex enterprise days, if you, if you pick up Drupal 8 and you install a multilingual site, it's very easy to do these things. So I'm very hopeful that it's going to expand Drupal's reach um, uh, immensely. So that was a purpose. <coughs> but of course, there's a lot of, lot of other ways you can find purpose in what you worked on. So I suggest you, uh, if you're looking for a project to work on, try to find how you can uh, circle that and try to communicate that. So one thing I tried in the initiative is to try to communicate this a lot of times and show people when there were tweets about how great their work was or there were praises at events, at sessions, uh, for how people found, found it useful for their work to use Google. So to communicate that to the team. Uh, the next. Uh, one I want to talk about is autonomy, because in, in, in open source, and if you don't have the power to grant autonomy to someone, it's very hard to to um, to get the opportunity to be autonomous. Because you can't, you go to the sprint room right now, sit down, find an issue, work on it, and then nobody will look at it for months. Okay. <laughs> so don't do that. No, no. no. So if you go to the sprint room, try to work on something, and then find somebody else who looks at it in the sprint room, walk to somebody else and say, hi, please look at this one. And then now the two of you look at it, and now they will find something else interesting about it. And then try to identify 
how it fits into the bigger project and what kind of people work on those things and try to ping those people and get their attention, etc. So, although you pick what you worked on, it's kind of pointless and, and it's not fruitful if it's, it's not going to work. So, <clears throat> what I tried in the initiative is to get a sense of autonomy to people by by empowering them to make what, they're, what they selected to work on happen, try to connect them with the community, and try to, um, try to make what they started to work on happen at the end. I don't have decision powers to, uh, to what's getting into Drupal 8. I'm not a core committer of Drupal 8. I technically actually can commit stuff to Drupal 8, by the way. I made three commits, but I'm not, by policy, I'm not allowed to commit to Drupal 8. I can commit uh, emergency patches. But there is a very uh, nice person um, who actually started from a very different angle on the right at, this, at the same point, and that's David Marquet. This person, David Marquet. So he uh, graduated in 1981, uh, top of his class from the US Army, and US uh, Naval Academy, sorry. Uh, which is an institute renowned for developing leaders to serve the, the US nation. So he joined the submarine force to exercise his experience. And along his journey, one, things that, one of the things that bothered him was the, was the traditional leader-follower model, where you tell people what to do and they follow you. And that's what, that's what um, captains are supposed to do on the ship, right? They go in and they tell you what to do, and you need to follow the orders. Um, so he tried to introduce a model of, um, of uh, autonomy on the ship where he was um, engineering officer at the USS Blue Rogers, and that completely failed, it didn't work, people didn't understand what to do, there was chaos, so they resorted back to leader Farrell model. And then, he was trained for a year to take over a nuclear powered submarine, the USS Olympia, he was training for a year to take it over. And then, two weeks before he took over the ship, uh, somebody else resigned on another ship, and they say, hey David, why don't you move to this ship? So he had two weeks to retrain for USS Santa Fe, which was a different kind of ship that he did not know about. It was also a nuclear attack submarine. So you're a captain of a nuclear attack submarine, you have no idea how it works. <laughs> and you need to give orders to people. So less than a month later, he was on the ship, uh, Santa Fe, and there was a simple drill to simulate a fault with the reactor on the ship. So what if the reactor goes off? And he shouted some commands that he believed right to fix the situation, and the officer on deck repeated the commands, and then nothing happened. And then he was like, wait, guys, why are you, why are you doing what I'm telling you to do? They were like, these commands are not valid on this ship. They are not, they don't make sense. And he was like, but why don't you repeat my command then? Because you're the leader, you're the captain, and I'm supposed to repeat your commands. And then when it reaches the, the point where it needs to be executed, it doesn't make sense. They are like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's not a good way to work on a nuclear submarine. It's gonna end in catastrophe. So he decided to try a different thing because he didn't have the time to learn the ship, right? So he needed to delegate authority um, by, by um, asking instead of uh, giving orders. So the classic leader follow model is this. Captain says, submerge the ship. Then the subordinate says, submerge the ship by okay. that's A. What, that's what happens. So he first uh, experimented with pushing control down so that he's, he's not going to decide if the ship needs to be submerged. So he asks the subordinate, what do you think we should do? <laughs> he has no idea, right? Like, he doesn't know the ship. So the submarine says, I think we should submerge the ship, sir. And he says, tell me you intend to do that. To get them to learn that they have control over what's going to happen. So they say, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. And that one needs to sing very well. <laughs> and then they submerge the ship. So the problem, of course, is you don't know if it makes sense to submerge the ship. Like that person, for some reason, thinks that they need to submerge it. And might, might or might not be a good idea. So the second component you work with is try to assure competence with the person. Um, so when somebody says, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, he asks, 
what do you think I'm concerned about? And that's the kind of thing when, when uh, the Drupal issue queue says you need to fill in the beta evaluation form. It's the same question, that how it fits into our current policy. It doesn't make sense at this stage in the Drupal core development process. It's the same model. So then the subordinate says, you're probably concerned about whether it's safe to do so, which is the most important question. Captain says, then can this be safe? And then they tell them, Captain, I intend to submit the ship. All crew are in the decks, the hatches are shut, the ship is ready for dive, and we've checked the bottom depth. And then all he needs to say is where you are. So what he's trying to do is push that control and ensure that what, have, what, what others are trying to do actually makes sense. And then the third thing is if, if it is the right thing to do. So if they have, if the per person wants to do something, is the person competent to decide if, if that can be done? And then the third question is, it is the right thing to do at this point? So then they say all the things that I said before, that they check all the check boxes on what needs to be done, and the captain can ask, is it the right thing to do? And then they say, yes, sir, our mission requires that we submerge the ship now in order to something. So if you can ensure that people, um, people know if it's the right thing to do, and they are competent in deciding what they are doing, then why not tell them to do what they want, right? So two years later, they got an inspection on the ship, and they got the highest grade ever seen in the US naval system. Because basically, in another ship, there is a captain that has like 134 puppets that they deal with, and they do all, all the things that they ask them to do. And on his ship, what happens is they have 135 people thinking about uh, thinking about what should be done, why it should be done, whether it fits in the mission, etc. So instead of them telling everyone what to do, everybody is a thinker and they can decide for themselves and verify if they think it needs to be verified. So while a lot of, I've seen people try to argue the introduction of a similar model to this one in uh, open source and specifically Drupal core development. Um, while it works at companies where you can make orders and your subordinates will do what you tell them to do, uh, it's dangerous because then you need to be the one to think. You cannot go home and eat dinner because they need, they, you need to answer the questions. So if you get others to think for you, then you can go on vacation and go to the beach and swim. Um, so that's what I try to do. Um, and the, um, basically the, the rule that I followed is we need to agree on goals and we need to leave room for autonomy. So if we agree on goals and where we are going, where we want to go, then the details do not matter. Some other initiatives went a much shorter distance because they were very attached to specific ways to do things. And instead of letting people to decide for themselves on the initiative, um, that basically ended up a few people doing all the work, all, only those few people who actually agreed on that thing. Instead, what I did is I was trying to delegate this. And I thought at first that that's going to uh, get stuff off my shoulders because that I don't need to decide on all the things. But at the end, it actually empowered people to work on things and it made them feel better about their work because they decided for themselves. And there were a lot of times they asked me about whether this is good to do, and I was like, I don't know, let's find somebody else to verify. Like, I would, like Drupal 8, I think it's uh, several times bigger than Drupal 7, so it's very hard to find someone who would be able to tell you about everything, um, if whether that's right or wrong to change. So, um, so the way I devised uh, trying to give autonomy to people is to support them in making their things happen and making their ways uh, through. Uh, there's actually a new documentation now that documents the main stakeholders in Drupal governance, which is basically the people working on different areas of Drupal core. So now, at the was, that was available four years ago when I started, so it was in our heads to try to figure out who to connect with you to review your things, but now it's documented. 
So if your dream is to get image handling in core or to have better responsive what something something, then then you'll find the people there to uh, connect with. Um, that's the pinging the people. Um, I also um, try to get people cross tag issues for different initiatives. So that's kind of an insider thing. You need to know that that VDC is the views in Drupal core tag for issues, the configuration system is the tag for configuration issues, etc. Once you get a hang of that, then you can uh, do those things and that attracts the attention of people working on views or a configuration system, etc. After a while, maybe. If not, then fall back on the previous point. Uh, if all of those fails, then you can still pair up people and issues. And by the way, by default, you should pair up people and issues anyway. Because if you don't pair them up, you go to Sprint, you work on something, you leave this conference. Two weeks, you're at home, your car breaks down, you have all of those things to deal with. You're not going to think, you're not going to work on the issue anymore. And others will not look at it either. And then two weeks later, you get bored and you don't care anymore. So if you pair people up, you can actually make progress together. We also use a Spring tag to keep track of the current focus issues. And we regularly repeat them to make progress. We drop issues that we didn't work on. We uh, put on issues that we worked on. Uh, so that acknowledged the autonomy of people working on different things, bringing them to the attention of the team and getting even more attention on it. Uh, we have public meetings um, to discuss issues, uh, which was very good to get new people in. So if you look at our public meetings now, mm, not a lot of people on our meetings now were on our meetings two or three or four years ago. So the team changed a whole lot in these years. What remained is we have an hour meeting every Wednesday and we ran out of the hour because there are too many people trying to discuss their things four years after we started, which I'm I don't know how to explain, it's probably due to a lot of these things we do. But there's not the same people, there are different people, but they are interested in coming with fixes and work and things they worked on and need help and need reviews. It's very good to uh, attract new people and reintegrate old people. Um, because there's old people, I mean people who used to work on the initiative and then they went off for something else and then they came back. Because they can feel the feel the progress going, feel the energy of the team happening. And the medium we used for these was also pretty important. We used text, we used IRC, because in a multilingual team, you need to use something that works. And they need to copy paste to Google Translate, or they need to go and try to understand what somebody said. It's not gonna work on video or phone calls. Some initiatives use phone calls or video, it, I don't think it would have worked for them. It's also very easy to lock the chat and then post it online and people review the chat later and we can reference the decisions from the chat log as well. Um, it's also pretty important to recognize issues if they are going off scope or towards a cliff. Like there's people who go off into a corner, they work on something which is amazing, it's very amazing, it's 200k patch, nobody's going to ever review it and they put their heart and soul into it, but it's not going to get into Drupal 4 ever. And this happened multiple times in the initiative. Sometimes the people burned out, sometimes they came, they came back. Um, you need to take, you need to keep attention on these and try to get them to, uh, to not do that. Uh, because they need to talk to the others, they need to talk to the community about the things they work on, otherwise it's not going to be accepted. Uh, no, nobody's going to review patch like that unless it's very important for Drupal 4. Um, and if they're going to work on it and nobody's going to accept it, they probably burn out and never, never come back. So you're lucky if they come back. You also need to recognize when somebody becomes unavailable. And if they worked on important things, try to get others to work on them. So when they come back, if they come back, they find that something happened with what they worked on and somebody else found it valuable. If you actually find it valuable, try to find people to work on them. Uh, sometimes I took on work from others when, when required um, attention. 
And last but not least, it, I think it's very important to praise people for working hard and also praise people for taking time off. It's not a problem. Go vacation, don't take time off. We've had people with all kinds of um, uh, reasons on initiative to go off for months or whatever, and that's fine. It's their life. Uh, if you care for them, if you praise them for taking the time off, uh, you actually have some chance for them to come back. Otherwise, if you just if you just push on them to work, 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 it's not going to happen. So, I, as I said, I delegated responsibility on the initiative, and I thought that uh, going to be uh, three uh, key people on the initiative. These three key people. So this is uh, Eric Steele, Stra Sutterson. He was working on the Alternate update module in Drupal 7, and he worked on getting Alternate update to Drupal core in Drupal 7. Um, and the middle person is Jose Rejero. He worked on the I18N and the variable modules in Drupal 7, and he worked on the configuration translation system in Drupal 8, naturally. And the person on the other side is Francesco Bossella. He worked on the entity translation system in Drupal 7, and the language negotiation and type system in Drupal 7, and he worked on those in Drupal 8 also. So that's kind of nice if you have people like these who are happy to work on things even four years after they worked on the same things in Drupal 7, and now they need to rewrite the whole thing again in Drupal 8 <laughs> two or three times because of BSR 0 and 4 and 5 and 7 and 11 and 12. Um, so, yeah, so I, so I relied on them to work on these things, but the reality is you delegate responsibility to them, but they are not going to be available all the time either. All of them had extend, extended leaves from the initiative, if you can uh, even say that, where they worked on something else, and in those cases we tried to find others to work on them. So we have several other people who are knowledgeable in any translation area or the uh, configuration translation system has uh, multiple maintainers in Drupal core, and actually in Drupal 8 none of them are Jose Rivero. So uh, he basically managed to um, pass on that to other people as well. So it's very important to plan for successors, um, so that you're not relying on specific people because that's not going to work, even for yourself. Uh, successors and cultivate small teams around things so that when somebody goes off and does something else, then it's it's fine because it doesn't really affect the work getting done. So one story for that is uh, I've had very difficult life experience, life experiences in the past four years. Uh, last year in the summer, my wife had internal bleeding. She lost 2.5 liters of blood, which is about half of your blood, right? So we were in emergency and she almost died and she was operated 11 p.m. Sunday. And that was right at uh, DrupalCon uh, Austin, I think. So I was obviously not there at DrupalCon Austin. I was back home with my wife. Um, and I was thinking that maybe her death, but uh, she's fine now. But it was very difficult. And, um, and I was very lucky that I had this team because I've had people on the site in Austin who led the multilingual sprint, who did multilingual sessions, who presented multilingual workshops, who did multilingual laugh, all those things, because I never tried to keep these to myself. And then they got together and they sent us this photograph uh, from Drupal in Austin. This is, not, this is not the multilingual team. There are a lot of different people from the community some from the multilingual team, and they promised to send us that paper and they never sent us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what confronts me much better is that my wife is fine, and we now have a very beautiful kid who's four months old. So practically, well, like if you count it back, so if we have a kid four months old, and my wife almost died last summer, if you count that up, then it's, yeah. So it was, it was uh, not an easy time afterwards either. So, <clears throat> so I got a lot of support from uh, the team. So this was directly in Austin, and then afterwards I was practically not attending events for a very long time. Um, I think this is my first conference I was speaking at, 
after Triple Crown in Amsterdam, I think, or something like that, uh, which was last, uh, last fall. So it's quite some time for someone who's, who's kicking a lot. So, um, how to build up that team? As I said, if you pair people up on issues, that they will develop the expertise of each other. Uh, if you are not required to make decisions, then uh, you can go eat dinner, as I said before, or uh, live your own life and have your own problems. Um, you need to recognize that whatever you work on, whatever, you'll have a very wide variety of needs in your work. So what we recognized is we needed health tech written, we needed usability testing, we needed uh, testing complex features, we needed help from views, we needed help from a lot of other places. We got a lot of help from the views initiative. Yeah, if you attend my session later today, you'll see that like views is a godsend for multilingual. Thank you, views initiative. I'm very happy for them. Um, we'll return to that again in the session. Um, so, recognize all of those things. One of the things we did is we did usability testing. And we got a lot of new contributors on the initiative thanks to that. There was uh, Darmish Mystery and Lisa Rex and Boyan Summers from the usability team who helped us write test scripts to test, um, test Drupal 8. We had people conducting the tests, myself and Ishtan. Uh, we've had Kathy Thais in, um, in Chicago conducting tests, and we've had young uh, Ranko um, also um, conducting those tests. So we distributed the test script, and we got a lot of test feedback from different places recorded with Google Hangouts, very easy for you thing to do. And we built in a lot of the feedback to fix the usability problems we found and made Drupal 8 better. So this is the kind of a thing that we did uh, several years ago, I think, two years ago probably, so way back in the day, um, because we thought that, hey, we have a user interface in core now, we need to test it. We didn't know if Drupal is going to be released in a year or two or three, who knows, but they need to be good. So as soon as you have these problems, you can integrate a lot of new kind of people into your initiative, and you never know what, they, uh, what they're going to help, uh, help you with at the end. Another thing that we did is providing added value with radical transparency. So as I said, we distributed the test script, but we also distributed something much more valuable, a, a Drupal 8 demo distribution for multilingual things. So this is, we did for last year DrupalCon Amsterdam with uh, Amy Dagman from Hook42. We sat down, we wanted to do a workshop where we can walk through the good features of Drupal 8 multilingual. So we made a distribution that you can install in four languages. And it has Google Translate text, so if you actually know French, then you will probably recognize issues here. But um, it has all kinds of things from views to, uh, to uh, menus to content types, etc. And we just we that was the first step to develop the distribution. We also developed uh, slides and we developed a 23-page handout with detailed description of the workshop. And we published all of these online, so people can deliver this workshop anywhere. There's actually someone delivering it in a couple months in India. Uh, that, we, that we didn't even know the person, like they found the workshop, they, they now do it in, in their native languages there. And it also makes it possible for you to walk through the features without uh, guidance, because it's a very detailed kind of. So, this brought us a lot of new contributors in terms of doing this, doing these sessions, presenting these sessions, and we hope that this also uh, provided a lot of insights for people who want to be our uh, tool. We also, as I've said, we had a friendly format for online meetings, text worked very well, and we uh, figured out that we need to meet and work in person. So virtual, open source work, kind of nice, but it's hard to make really good progress in a virtual setting. So what changed uh, for us and for the Drupal community in general was DrupalCon Denver and a few people attending um, was the first thing for the multilingual team where we uh, organized a pre-sprint and a post-sprint before and after the conference. So DrupalCon is normally four days if you attend the DrupalCon. 
It starts on Tuesday, unless you go to a training, which is not 4,000 people, it's just a couple hundred people. So you go to Tuesday, there's three days of sessions and then a sprint day. And what we figured out is you're traveling through the half of the globe anyway, why not arrive early and leave late? So the four day conference, we've added five additional days to the conference, three days before and two days after. And that we did that for DrupalCon Denver. And there were attend some attendees. Then we figured out after the fact that the views people also organized something, but they didn't tell others because they had funding and they didn't want this problem about that, etc. Um, so, so we got that done and we were very happy with that. And now if you look at the DrupalCon schedule, the pre and post prints are a standard part of the DrupalCon. They promote that on the sprint page. They, they have sponsors for it. They, uh, they organize the contracts for the space. They help with ordering food. So the thing that we did for the multilingual team at DrupalCon Denver, because we wanted to get it done, transform DrupalCon from four days or five days if you attended the, the trainings to uh, nine days. It's not bad. Um, so the reason that it's much better to work with a longer setting is you can actually sit down and get something done in multiple days. If you only attend a Friday sprint, you sit down, you work on something, and by the time you set up your development environment, which has an outdated PHP version, and your web server is broken, and then you need to update your Vagrant box and whatever, and then by the time you set it up, it's already afternoon, you went for lunch, you want to chill out a bit, talk to people, have a co have, um, co have coffee, and then you work on something, you post it, maybe you don't post it, you, you're gonna post it on the way to the airport, but that's not gonna ever happen. No, forget about it and end that stuff. So, so if we are in the same space for a longer time, it works much better. And the next thing we did is right after DrupalCon Denver, DrupalCon Barcelona happened, and by then we organized the extended space, to, uh, not DrupalCon Barcelona, Drupal Dev Days Barcelona. And by that time, we organized the extended sprint together with the news team. And we got Pedro Cumbra in Barcelona to help us with the space for a whole week. And that, again, transformed Drupal Dev Days because Drupal Dev Days used to be a three-day event, and now it's seven days because it starts on Monday and it lasts until Sunday night. And now, if you go to Drupal Dev Days, there are no sessions on the first uh, three days. And there are still this many people at Drupal Dev Days working on things. There are no sessions to attend. They just sit down and work on things. And, and now the organizers complain that in Seged we upped the, the bat by actually ordering a place for every day, on, all day, all night, and gave them food and everything. And they're like, no, it's very expensive to organize Drupal Dev Days. Because you have all these printers coming and they need food and then it's paid for a week. It's crazy. Um, it's, and it's, yeah, I'm kind of proud that we started that in Barcelona with the multilingual sprint. Sorry for um, the hardship with organizing Google Dev Days at this point. Um, so, so, um, so what, what the sprints help you is get better at things. So we've collected a lot of quotes at Google Dev Days second where people sit down on Monday and they could actually work with we have the lead core developers, major core developers on things, and they get things done by Wednesday. And it's very empowering to learn things and get better at things. And that's where it comes back to mastery. And for that, I actually had a special, special person to talk about it who was mastering her skills in guitar play back at DrupalCon Denver, same event, uh, Kathy Face. Um, but uh, she did not end up playing that much guitar because she found us in the lobby sprinting a multilingual. So what happened for her in Denver is that she went into the sprint on Friday and her rush did not work. So she assembled a set of people in, in a table to work who had rush problems to fix their rush problems and she fixed she helped fix everyone's rush problems except herself. So she had a broken rush, but everybody else had their rush fixed. Uh, and she got it fixed a day later, I think, by someone else. Um, so she kind of got into Denver with a mindset to get people improve their things and to mentor them on how that works. Uh, and 
she brought that to the multilingual team as well. So it was totally accidental that we bumped into each other in the hotel lobby in Denver. And we were still there because we just started the extended sprints. And we were still there and she joined the multilingual team. And then she kind of spread this approach to mastery, to approach to mentoring through the multilingual team. So if you now go to a DrupalCon or a Drupal Dev Days and you look at the mentor shirt people, uh, almost all of the multilingual team will be in mentor shirts. So I'm at the multilingual sprint and like maybe sitting there with two or three people who are tired to go mentor, something like that. But then everybody else goes and mentors uh, others. So that kind of spread from the multilingual team. And it's of course not that there's a lot of others on the mentor team, but I'm also pretty proud of her contribution to the team that she brought in this uh, mentorship attitude and that spread. And as you say, the rest is history. So if you want to read more about these two concepts of how to give uh, autonomy or how to um, hand over autonomy, then maybe Marque has this book, Turn the Ship Around, and Betty Upping has the book called Drive that's uh, very powerful for um, with more examples of these three uh, principles. So then, we don't have a lot of time for scope and time, but I don't have a lot to say about them because they are hard. So now you have the people and you motivate them and they work on things, and now you need to manage the scope and time. So, they, so that what you want to get is done in some reasonable time, although you don't have any idea when it's going to be released, and in some reasonable scope, so it's actually committed and it's actually useful. So for that, there was uh, this wonderful person, uh, Shannon Vettes, who at London 2011 summer approached Angie Byron and said, hey, I have some time from my employer and maybe I can help with the communication of the initiatives and, and project management things. So she's actually a trained project manager who came in and tried to help us uh, work this out. And what she tried to do is for us to better communicate the things we do with the community and try to figure out dependencies between what we do and set up milestones so that when we reach a uh, point, we can say if we reach our goals or we did not. She had a very hard time on the team, by the way, we gave her a very hard time because it's hard to plan scope and time when you are not sure of your, how many people you have to work with and how much of you work. <coughs> So again, I think what helps with that is if you agree on goals and leave room for autonomy, you can set goals on scope and you can set goals on time. Um, the, what the Drupal community tries to set goals on time is we set up policies that says if you work on this issue, it only fits into the beta releases if it passes this checklist, and then you can look at the checklist and it says, okay, it does not. Um, and we manage scope by trying to split up issues into different parts and then try to uh, try to make them smaller so we can actually get them done and get it in and then figure out the rest if it's still important or not. So we manage a very big backlog of issues, a lot of issues that we probably never going to ever solve. Uh, what's important here if you work on something Drupal is you need to be uh, strictly on Drupal or other people will sh shout your head up if you work somewhere else. And you need to groom your backlog because there's always going to be new people coming into your sprints looking for something about UX testing, or or the help text fix here, or uh, that error in views for matter something something. Then you will be like, I don't know. And you will be like, yes, I know that's an issue. Let's work on it, and then I will find somebody else to work on. So if you groom your backlog, you know what's in there. Then you can always match people with an issue. So the way we found grooming our backlog is because Drupal.org sucks at that. Really. It, it sucks. It's, it's not a good tool. We built a different tool to visualize our backlog. It works off of Drupal.org issues. It's called RocketShip. If you go to Drupal.org, there's a module called RocketShip, and it, it gets all the data from Drupal.org issues and then visualizes them in a much better way, based on priority and status, and highlights people who work on them and stuff like that. <coughs> and then we keep this visualization of this, the current issues that we work on in the sprint so that people see what's important, and then we can review it very quickly and get stuff done. Uh, thankfully, we now have all that data. We can also look at who's working on the initiative. Um, so, like, I'm here talking about all this work, but there's actually people starting from there to there. 
bigger names actually contributed, some more and older names actually contributed more recently. And that's not actually the whole list, but the oh, okay. whole list. So anyone who did not pay attention, that was animation. So, so there is uh, over 1,200 people who worked on the initiative, and that's a pretty long tail of people to work with. And uh, every single one of them at least commented on one of the issues, which means they reported the issue, or they reviewed it, or they put, posted a screenshot, or they had some complaint, something, and they contributed to the local English ship. So that's uh, 1,200 people in four years. I think it's not bad. Um, and as I said, regular public meeting in an accessible format works again for scope management and time because you can discuss it live with people, break issues down, post reviews on the spot. I do that all the time. And then explain to people why something would be um, thrown back, etc. It's very good because that's a fixed time that you can expect different people from all kinds of time zones to hopefully be together as much as possible. And then I did a lot more reading after those two books. And I read a book from um, Chip and Dan Heath that's called Switch, How to Make Change When Change is Hard. And if there's only one thing you take away from this session, that's the book you take away. Chip and Dan Heath, Switch, How to Make Change When Change is Hard. An amazing book, like you need to read it from page to page. It has like practical tips for everything. If you don't have the authority to give orders and you need to get stuff done. All kinds of things. One of the things that inspired me is a car wash story. So they had, they um, experienced that if they had a, so how do you say this better? So let's say you operate a car wash and you want people to come back. You have a small piece of paper that has eight holes in it and you need to stamp every piece and then you get a free car wash if every single one is stamped. So they made a little experiment if they had a piece of paper with eight squares on it and they had a piece of paper with ten squares on it, but two were already stamped. <laughs> so both of them required you to collect eight stamps to get a free uh, car wash. Obviously the two of those were already stamped um, got like 25% uh, more uh, people coming back. So that's only one of the stories. They, the book has a lot of great stories. So this is a story around making people feel they are already on the way to getting there, right? So I got very inspired by this story and some other similar stories and decided that we need to get that in the multilingual initiative. We need to get people feel like we are, we are almost there, although we may be multiple years but they need to feel like we're almost there and we need to get more feedback on what we work on. So, what I started on is a blog post series. So what I did is I explained them, hey, these are all the cool things you get, and these are all the things they are broken with. These are all the issues with these cool things. So I decided to write short, very short posts, tidbits, around improvements in the multilingual initiative. Hey, this is the cool thing, and at the end, by the way, it's broken. <laughs> Uh, and here are the issues that you can help us with. So you're already very excited about, oh, that's cool. And you're like, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> what to do about that? Um, and then, later on, I went back and I crossed out the things that have been done, which is a recursive trick for the same thing. Because they already see that, oh, that's already done. Mm. So I can maybe do something else about the others. Um, so, um, so I, I took this and I and I made that happen, and it actually helped solve issues on the multilingual initiative, and also uh, aligned well with the give, uh, radical transparency giving away thing that I talked about earlier. Then the other thing I did for the same thing is collecting live Drupal 8 multilingual sites. Um, there's uh, this is also like a thing. All of these are Drupal 8 multilingual.org, by the way. So now there's a list of live sites, so if you work on a multilingual issue, you can see that, wow, I actually help these people, these uh, companies, businesses, etc., to set up their sites. And then, uh, mo most lately, I decided that we need, to, uh, we need to be even more looking like we are done, because we are hopefully almost done. So I created a very short three-minute video about the initiative that summarizes the top benefits and then made a list of the top benefits. So I kept 
uh, iterating on the site to adapt to the state of the initiative at the time. And it seems crazy, right, that we make it look like the Drupal 8 is ready, but data proves it, that we need to make it appear that Drupal 8 is ready. So this is actual data from XJM, uh, Drupal 8 critical issues in the data phase, and every, every issue uh, on the chart is different. So we started with a number of issues and then we solved them. So these are the issues we fixed, and these are the issues we found. So we keep fixing issues, but then we find new things. So it's not like we keep working on the same thing. We need people to look at AAA to use it and find those issues and then have us fix them. So it's not, so we, we, need, to, uh, we need to get people to use it. And by, by showing that actually people use it and by showing all the benefits that you get from using it, uh, we help get more eyes on it and that's where it comes back to new people on the discussions um, appearing who need stuff fixed. So if you need to put that in your own framework, if you need, need your own initiative solved in Drupal 9 or Drupal 8.1, look for the release process descriptions of Drupal. This is the release process description for Drupal 8. Um, you need to adapt your approach based on where you are. So we are now at the end of beta releases, nearing the release candidate. So we need to focus on critical API changes and release blockers, and people should start creating new modules, and site builders should start testing the delay. So you need to adapt your communication to that approach, so you get the best feedback and the kind of people you need to solve your problems. So if you want to get media in Drupal 9 or Drupal 8.1, then adapt your uh, approach to uh, the process. And then, good luck timing dependencies. I don't have any good suggestions for those. There is a lot of people working on all kinds of things in Drupal Core, so it's very hard to, uh, to time those right. Um, it helps if it takes four years, then you, need, then you have some wiggle room if you don't get things right. So if you want to learn more about these tricks, I really, really, really suggest you read this book. I'm just rereading re it right now, by the way, it's still golden. Um, so as I've said, uh, looking at this is not a very good idea, but if you look on these angles, you need to think about people as an, as an infinite pool. If you can give them autonomy, have them master their craft, and give them, uh, and give them a reason to come to you, then they will come. Because they get better, they decide what they work on, and they work for something useful. That's always nice. Uh, for scope tracking, I suggest communication, 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 communication. That's what Drupal Core does. And they always tell you where the release is, what are the uh, policies now, what are the criteria for things getting in. And if, if you communicate well, the people will understand that and they will be able to adapt. And you use issues and break them down to uh, smaller pieces so you can, you can push things later if you don't have time for them and you agree on goals so that you can keep, uh, keep the uh, scope in check. You, can, you have something to check against. And for time management, you can try milestones and tracking dependencies, but I don't, it's, like, it's really hard, so that's the, that's the hardest part. We'll really see coming up in Drupal 8.1 that should only take six months how we do on time and scope. That's gonna be a real check. So in summary, instead of being freaked out that everybody else is, uh, that people are working on their things and they will steal your things, um, be actually happy about that they work on other things because they solve problems for you. They bring in new people. Uh, you can help solve their problems so your things work better. And <clears throat> you can adapt to whatever situation comes and, um, and get better at, at making things happen that you want to. That was my talk, and I actually used up all the time, so we'll see if we have uh, time for questions. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes? How much time did you spend yourself still writing code, actually? 
were you like full time on, on cat herding or no no so so I was lucky that I've had free time to work on the multilingual project. I always tried to negotiate more work time for it, but it was always hard to negotiate more work time for it. I think um, it's easier to recognize after the fact how useful something is that you worked on. So that's the. So I sometimes tried the ask for forgiveness instead of permission principle where you work on something and then it proves useful and it might and sometimes work, sometimes it's not. But yes, my, uh, my, my work time is um, paid for working on Drupal core criticals at this point. And it used to be um, paid for working on whatever blocks Drupal they released. And sometimes was actually multilingual issues. So even to this day, there are issues that are somehow multilingual um, that block release. For example, right now there is an issue for entity, automatic entity scheme updates that blocks the release. And that is due to multilingual because we needed to have dynamic database schemas for entities. So um, then I, I get to work on things in my initiative, but that's only when, when it blocks things. But since we got so many people working on things and so many features in core, there's some things somewhere multilingual, critical or major always happening. How will you manage this after release? Will you lose people? How did I manage this after? How will you manage this after 8.0 is released? And probably we will, will lose a lot of people. Lose. Lose as in lose interest. Lose interest. Lose interest in contributing or lose interest in Drupal 4 or no, in contributing. I mean not necessarily interest in time. And now it's like a push. Let's get this done. Yeah. And then afterwards, it's released and some sort of relaxation happens? Yes. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose we kind of lose team. Lose team. Lose, uh, I don't think it's a problem for us to take rest. Uh, we need to take rest to re recharge. Um, I think there's, there's, always, like, there's always something that we did not think about or we did not work on. There's definitely media handling that could be improved uh, in, in Drupal 8 and will be improved. So I think it's a matter of finding the things that people are passionate about. And if something is worth making a Drupal core initiative, it needs to have people who are passionate about it because otherwise, why the hell is it getting into Drupal core? I, you know, doesn't, like, it doesn't add up. If people are not interested in getting it fixed, then why, why are you putting in resources? So I think as long as there's people, there's things that people are passionate about, then we'll find those people and we can uh, use similar or the same principles to get them um, get them work on it. I don't think these would be impossible to apply to media or or whatever other other like decoupling Drupal or whatever other thing that people want to work on layouts, all kinds of things that we haven't done that yet. There's definitely some time we need to take for the rest of them. It's always the new shiny thing. Um, I'm going to talk about the bugs that will be found. Yeah. Because when all the people jump ship into the place, then a lot of bugs will be found very fast. Yes. Hopefully. So there are yes, there are bugs. So as the as the graph showed, there's always bugs we found. So yes, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons we want to get to RC faster because then more people will look at it and will find bugs. So the more people look at it, the more bugs will be found and the more bugs can be fixed. Um, and I don't think that's a problem if people don't look at it, like if we are afraid that people are gonna look at it and find the bugs, then the bugs will never be fixed. And people will not look at it. So we need to manage that expectation somehow. We, we need to, like, as my blog posts did, they said this is cool, but this is the look. So, we need to manage expectations in some way that yes, it's very cool, but it's not not entirely fully ready yet. Did you have anybody who was like your um, your brain trust for thinking about these community hacks that you've basically been doing? Um, because it, it really looks like you've been very consciously engineering the initiative and the community and like working on improving how things work. Mm -hmm. Did you have like a, a, a team of people that that's kind of 
met about that regularly, or there was just you and, and then some random encounters? There's a lot of random good luck things, yeah. like the like the way that Kathy brought in the the mentoring mastery aspect. I haven't thought about it that much, and then I realized that after the fact how important it was. I would not take credit for all of the things here. I definitely read a lot. As I've said, the switch book really opened my eyes and, and made a lot of things happen that I haven't thought about before uh, that helped the initiative. Um, so there's, there's a lot of influence. I don't have a regular group of people I meet with. There's a recent pretty big fail. <laughs> One of the things I tried is I have a talk later today and I tried to be very clever and crowdsource the content of the talk. I was like, hmm, so let's get people to try to relate, figure out hacks, that they funny hacks, and they send it in, and we get them prices. And I got Amazing Labs and Book 42, I donated prices, and yes, the number of entries the, the contest got. In a month, one. Zero. Zero. So, there's, there's, so I, we tried a lot of things that failed. And I checked that idea with people and I got feedback about how it was not understandable and I did not consider the feedback enough. So I'm, I'm bouncing off ideas of people sometimes and sometimes I just go off and do it because I have a half weekend that I can dedicate to doing a video or writing an article or something and then see what happens. Okay, uh, thanks for coming and let's do lunch. <laughs>